Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the second Infineon Tech event. Uh, we are here live from Singapore uh, this evening, and a very warm well welcome to all of you joining us virtually. We are delighted also to be joined by a very large audience in person here on the 51st floor of the Capitol Spring Building. Please give yourself a round of applause. And for those of you joining uh, the Tech4 event uh, via live stream, uh, it's important you have a little bit of context about where we are this evening. So we are in one of Singapore's tallest skyscrapers. It's in the heart of Singapore's financial district, but we're surrounded by plants. Um, this modern space has been designed using biophilic principles, uh, meaning that nature has been integrated into many of its spaces. So there are green spaces in the building, steel and glass facade, and a four-story green oasis uh, that mimics a tropical rainforest. I'm told there are 80,000 plants and trees uh, across the building, and on the rooftop, there's an urban farm, it's around 400 meters squared, uh, that has over 150 spe species of edible plants that the chefs here uh, use uh, in the restaurants, and we'll be sampling some of those later this evening. Um, the building's been designed by the architect Carlo uh, Ratti, who I'm sure many of you might have heard about. He specializes in integrating digital technology uh, into the built environment, and he also runs the MIT Sensible Cities Lab. Uh, a research group that explores how new technologies are changing the way that we understand, design, and ultimately live in cities. Uh, it's an incredibly appropriate uh, d um, location for our discussion today, uh, in which we're going to be discussing how technology can tr contribute to a sustainable future. So this is the second um, tech for event we did. We did one a few months ago uh, in June in Munich. Uh, and obviously the topic is ever increasingly more important and urgent. Uh, so to uh, explore this topic, we have a real expert panel with us today. Distinguished experts who I hope are going to enlighten us and offer us a vision of how we can address uh, humankind's most pressing challenges. Starting to my right, Andreas Urschitz is CMO and member of the board at Infineon Technologies. Andreas has been with Infineon Technologies for 27 years and has driven technological solutions to shape the decarbonization and digitalization of the world. Andreas believes that technical development should not be an end in itself, but should make life better, protect the future of humanity, and even make the world safer and more livable. Andreas grew up on a farm and learned early on how important it is to make sustainable choices. He's our host this evening. Tuli Karaj is the co-founder and CEO of Sun Green H2, an award-winning deep cleantech startup. The company is transforming green hydrogen production via nanostructured materials for low-cost electrolysis at scale. Talika has over $2 billion tra trans transaction experience in renewable and low-carbon energy, having successfully scaled wind and solar companies and led large project investments at BP Alternative Energy and renewable funds including Denon Capital, Octopus Investments and Keppel Capital. Capital. Tulika received an MBA from London Business School and Bachelor of Technology in Electrical Engineering from the in Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Welcome, Tulika. To my left, we have Professor Mengho Son Sonwoo. He's the Chair Professor at the Department of Automotive Convergence at Korea University and currently President of Control Works Co., a technology company working on smart green mobility. Professor Sam Wu is an acad academician of the National Academy of Engineering of, of Korea and was an advisor to the Presidential Advisory Council on Science and Engineering, a fellow member of SAE International, as well academician of the National Academy of Engineering of Korea. He also holds the position of president of the Electric Vehicle Association of Asia Pacific. Welcome, Professor Sam Wu. Our final speaker today, uh, is Xinying Tok, who is head of Southeast Asia, uh, the Carbon Trust in Southeast Asia. 
Xinyin currently leads and grows the team in Singapore across the whole region. She's 12 years experience working as a banker, an ESG consultant, and philanthropic grant maker in Southeast Asia and China. The Carbon Trust is a global climate consultancy driven by the mission to accelerate the move to a decarbonized future. It's been pioneering decarbonization for more than 20 years for businesses, governments, and organizations around the world. Xinying has worked for governments, companies, large institutional investors, and philanthropic entities on issues like energy transition, electric mobility, clean cooling, ESG, and green finance to accelerate the low carbon transition in Asia for the last eight years. Please welcome this evening's panel. So a reminder that we will be uh, taking questions about 45 an hour, uh, an hour into the session. Uh, please do address uh, the speakers because it really then helps us to keep the discussion lively. So delighted to be starting. I'm going to be starting with you, Andreas. And um, obviously, I think we've outlined that obviously tackling climate heating is humanity's greatest challenge and a hugely, hugely complex undertaking, as you mentioned, because. And because of this complexity, many organizations, many individuals really feel a little overwhelmed. They don't know where to start. How do you think about the practical ways um, in which progress can be made in this area that can have real impact and really create momentum? Yeah, look, uh, I believe uh, we have uh, two choices. Uh, one of which is uh, wait for policymakers and somebody else getting it done or start with uh, ourselves and uh, do the first steps. And to give you maybe one or two inspirational examples, I just recently uh, got pushed a lot by my wife uh, on using the bicycle for inner city uh, moving from A to B and mobility. That was for me a very hard step to do because I got so much used to the car and go from A to B to C. Uh, but uh, once I tried it for a couple of times, uh, I started to realize that uh, it uh, does bring me even faster from A to B relative to the car. It's much more convenient. I don't need to search for parking lots and many other things. And I do something good for, for planet Earth. Uh, so having said that, such practical examples everybody can think about. Uh, it has to do with you making and us making considerations of uh, what is the way of living, the way of uh, consumption, in that case, consumption of mobility, we want to uh, practice and therefore do uh, some contribution. Yeah, I think that that's the thing. It's like we can all make these steps. We can all actually have this kind of impact. But I guess when we're talking about scale, that's how we really want to sort of think that, you know, we can, we can really move the dial on this. So, Talika, let's talk about this from a, a startup point of view. Mm -hmm. So, clearly, we're going to need significant technological breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. You've got deep experience in scaling renewables. You're now part of a new company working on scaling hydrogen. What do you think is the best way to drive both innovation, the part that you're doing, but also scale that um, in, in climate-related technology? Yeah. I think uh, when we think about innovation, uh, it goes hand in hand with scale. What I mean by that is you cannot have innovation in isolation. Innovation has to have some impact. Uh, and in order to have any kind of meaningful impact, you already need scale. So particularly uh, Sunbeam H2, we work in the hydrogen space. Uh, and one of the things that we're interested in addressing is large scale, deep decarbonization in very hard to abate sectors. What do I mean by that? Wind and solar are today large scale. They've scaled up in 91% of the world's electricity markets. Wind and solar are the cheapest new form of generation. Did you know that renewable electricity can only solve 25% of our CO2 emissions problem, though? There are very many sectors. 75% of the world's CO2 emissions are sitting and residing in those sectors that cannot be renewably electrified, at least directly. Mm -hmm. So we're interested in Sun Green H2. We're interested in addressing this challenge. How do you decarbonize 75% of the world's CO2 emissions? And that's where I think we have to think about newer technology, technology that can make a large scale impact on a very large amount of CO2 emissions. This is hydrogen, batteries, many different technologies that are all going to work together at scale in order for us to achieve a net zero emissions future. 
Uh, and in particular for hydrogen, we are talking about being able to address some very large scale markets like ammonia making. That's how we feel the world. Mm. 90 million tons of hydrogen. Hydrogen is already at scale. 90 million tons of hydrogen is already being consumed worldwide. It goes into making our ammonia to feed the world. It goes into making our methanol. Methanol is, uh, interestingly, something that is an everyday part of our lives, from car parts to paints to construction materials. Methanol goes into making them. Do you know methanol is made from hydrogen? So these are some very large-scale uses of commodities, everyday commodities that we can decarbonize at scale if we can figure out a way to decarbonize hydrogen. That's what we're interested in doing at Sun Green H2. And that's how I think innovation is going to make an impact. Andrea, uh, please. Allow me a question. So I was myself uh, uh, quite a while ago uh, buying a few stocks on a hydrogen company. Uh, so that was exactly at the peak of these. <laughs> there's of no, these, there's uh, no conflict of, uh, of interest here, is there? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely not. Uh, so, but uh, I was, I was, uh, then the stock went down, of course, after I bought it. <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> uh, what I wish to uh, better understand is, uh, so how, how mature is this technology? Uh, yeah. From what I understand, uh, people tell me this mature, so where is the problem? Yeah. Why doesn't hydrogen usage go through the roof? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's interesting what you mentioned. Hydrogen usage is actually already through the roof in the sense that the 90 million tons I talk about is a $150 billion market. So it is quite a bit in use. The problem with hydrogen at the moment is almost all of it is made from fossil fuels. You and I are here to talk about how technology can make a difference to sustainable future. But actually, there is no sustainable future if it's, uh, a fundamental part of that is carbon dioxide emissions. So what we need to urgently do is to take out the CO2 emissions from hydrogen. Um, and that is water electrolysis, the splitting of water molecules, H2O, into hydrogen and oxygen, mm. eliminating completely the use of fossil fuels which are currently used for this job. The problem that you highlight very well is it's very cheap and it's very efficient at the moment to use fossil fuels to do the job. So as a human race, as businesses, we have no incentive to switch to something from something that is very low cost. This is what we're here to change. Please remember that when we electrolyze water, the two critical ingredients that you need are renewable electricity and the electrolyzer machine. Now, up until date, in the last 10 to 15 years, we have seen renewable electricity, as I said, become cheap, and it's getting cheaper by the minute. One critical ingredient is available at low cost. We are here to make the second ingredient low cost. So as we innovate around electrolyzers, make them higher yield efficiency, make them less reliant on precious metals, completely eliminating these precious metals, and make them low cost, finally we have both the ingredients for the recipe that is here to make green hydrogen available at low cost. But I was very much wondering uh, how such technological trends, and obviously the technology is mature, uh, can find their influx much faster, for instance, into big corporations. And I got uh, impressed by what you told me, Xin Ying, be before, uh, with regards to uh, how to influence big corporations, or also policy making uh, towards uh, being a faster part of the solution and acceleration. So what, what has it about? Um, I think for the Carbon Trust, because of our mission, which is to accelerate this move to a decarbonized future. It means that we want to work across all levers, right? So innovation is a lever, but at the point of wanting to create skill, we start to think about what policy is going to need to come in to ensure that that skill can happen, right? So policy includes carrots as well as sticks. So in the, in the work that we do at the Carbon Trust, we try to help governments. Um, the one part of the work that we do with governments is to help them think about what kind of carrots and what kind of sticks. And sometimes the carrots look like financial mechanisms to help, um, governments, uh, to help the government entity entice and incentivize businesses to become more energy efficient. And then, the and then the sticks are, how do you put in mandatory standards? How do you put in carbon price? I think just now Tuliku was talking about. Um, once uh, Singapore raised its carbon price from what it is now to an outlook of $25 in the next um, upturn and then towards $80. How would businesses then change the way they think about the choices that they have to make? I think that's part of the reason why we still work with lots of governments across the Southeast Asia region. And then when we work with corporates, um, over the last 20 years, we've worked with hundreds of corporates, all the way from very simple footprinting. You cannot 
you cannot reduce what you don't know, so you measure it first. And then you have to target set. How do you get ambitious about the target setting? How do you enable a company to think about what is it that it will take for themselves to have that level of ambition? And so now we've consolidated a lot of that work into what we call our route to net zero standard, which goes from there are many steps. We recognize there are many steps along this way. You can start um, uh, being part of this standard by just ensuring that you measure, ensuring that you have some form of target. But as you move towards the standard, as you get more and more confident of where you can get into, you have to get towards net zero. You have to make a commitment that you will get to net zero by 2050. In that context, could you give a practical example uh, with regards to there's so many uh, executives then also here from, uh, yeah. from different areas. So if, if somebody asks uh, himself or herself the question, so how can I accelerate uh, the green transition, let's call it, uh, towards more sustainability within my company? What are you proposing then? Um, every company is very different. So even when we talk about the tech industry, depending on where you are, um, uh, where you are on the value chain, the type of change that you can make is quite different. So we don't, we, as Carbon Trust, we're not really here to say this is the way you have to do it. It's more important that once you measure and once you use that measurement and those numbers to engage internally, you then make this a strategic decision. What does it mean for your business strategically? And you bring the best of your own people, the best of your minds together to make that change happen. And then you need to think beyond your own walls. Every single business has a value chain. It doesn't stop within your own operations. The change that we need to ha see happen needs to go beyond our doors. Mm. So which company can play the role of engaging the rest of your suppliers, the rest of your purchasers, try to make that ecosystem change to enable this green transition? Um, there is a slide up here, which I suppose is being live streamed, so I should talk to it. <laughs> one, of the, one of the biggest things that the Carbon Trust does, aside from uh, working with governments solely or corporates solely, is to create these types of industry-level collaborations. Um, the flagship work that we do is our offshore wind accelerator. Almost every single uh, key player in the offshore industry is this part of our accelerator. Over the last 12, uh, more than 12 years of the work that we have done, this accelerator platform has enabled the offshore wind industry to reduce the cost of energy by 15% on average. The whole industry as a whole in the UK and the EU has saved 34 billion pounds of dollars of money. This makes offshore wind feasible. It makes offshore wind cheap enough for people to use. It is this type of industry collaborations that we need to see happen in more and more places, including the tech industry. So, Professor Sun, I'd love to bring you in now. We've talk, been talking about this kind of decarbonisation journey sure. that we're on, and we've seen the automotive industry really transform in the last few years, you know, the, the electrification of, of so many vehicles. Um, but obviously, the production of vehicles is also carbon intensive. There was exactly. a McKinsey report, I think, that said that something like 60% by 2040, 60% of a vehicle's emissions are going to come from material sure. production. So how do you think the automotive industry can best deal with these upstream challenges? OK, that's a very good question. But I'd like to start with some uh, interesting slide. Would you please? OK, this one already, Andreas mentioned that. Uh, I'd like to share with you. Uh, total CO2 emission by uh, various industry sectors, including power industry, transportation, etc. However, energy sector provide the major CO2 emission. So that's why I'm here to feel guilty to reduce <laughs> the uh, transportation <laughs> e e CO2 emission. Among 20% out of 78% uh, from land vehicle is road vehicle. So every day we actually use a road vehicle for commute, and the rest of them just only less than just 21% by aviation, marine, and etc. So how we can achieve decarbonization by this transportation, especially a land vehicle? This is the solution we actually now propose to the uh, market. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Okay, these are the options for all uh, customers. First of all, full hybrid. Uh, we already introduced and we sell many full hybrid vehicles already. 
plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. And also, in these days, uh, battery electric power uh, is very popular become. And then eventually, we're trying to introduce fuel cell electric vehicle, which will be used by uh, hydrogen, he mentioned. But look at this, nothing comes free. There is no free lunch. In order to uh, introduce full hybrid requires uh, three to five K US dollar. That's the additional cost. So we have to understand or a client understand why this vehicle is expensive than others. Plug-in hybrid requires uh, more battery size. So that actually costs another uh, eight to 10 K but in order to build battery electric vehicle requires 15 to 20 K, which is 50 to 60% more expensive than conventional uh, internal combustion engine propelled vehicle. Fuel cell, no matter what, you have to pay more 60 K. So these are the options. But how we can promote this vehicle to uh, client to reduce the uh, CO2, that's the key. That I would like to share with you today and there are several options. Before, before we go another topic, let me tell you one important thing. Because you guys are from Impinion, semiconductor company. Uh, based on my uh, experience, I got my bachelor's, master's degree from electrical engineering, so I studied as an electrical engineer. I studied at Philips Electronics. In these days, to become NXP, you are a strong competitor but you are better than an XP. <laughs> I understand that. He's trying to gain, get, gain favor with the audience. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> then I moved to California, to Detroit, to join General Motors. That was uh, uh, mid-80. That time, GM was the number one manufacturer. But not many people understand GM had 12 largest semiconductor company at the time. 12 largest semiconductor. Still exist. The name of the company is Delco Electronics. So semiconductor is the core technology for future mobility. So we have to be very proud of your company, Infineon. In, in the later on, I'm going to cover a little bit more about what type of technology will be essential for future mobility. So talking yeah. about uh, future technology for mobility other than the electrification, what is the thinking on uh, the automated uh, driving being part of the solution to reduce uh, CO2 emission? Well, you know, Greg asked me to don't say more than two, three minutes per, per topic. <laughs> I already used my time, but I if you don't I think mind. we can break that rule. I think, I think it's completely <laughs> fair. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay. In the future, uh, autonomous driving technology and also uh, electric vehicle technology, that will change the whole uh, transportation platform. So as you understand, uh, autonomous driving, level four, without driver, it can go anywhere in the world. So that means, for example, at this time, 1.2 billion vehicles are registered. But how many vehicles can be used for daily base? Even you are driving a vehicle, but only takes maybe use two to three hours. Rest of the time, just sleep and stop. So in the meantime, I mean, by the year 2040, all most global OEM trying to introduce the autonomous driving, level four or level five. That time, once you use your vehicle to commute, then probably you will park. But rest of the time, someone will come and pick those vehicles to make some money, like autonomous robot tax. So they can generate the revenue, so they can split with the company and the vehicle owners. So that's the another a form of a platform. That's the reason in these days, including Volkswagen, you know, like General Motors, Hyundai Motor Group, everybody trying to transform from the original conventional automobile company to life cycle business model company. So that's the key for future. It's not far away very soon you will see that type of platform in the market. So in 2040, do you think you will still own a car? <laughs> you mean 2040? 24? 2040. Ah, 2040, yes, I believe so. Because 2040 will be the... Uh, by the 2040, all manufacturers should 
uh, assemble only electric vehicle only. And will you, and will you share your car? Uh, sure. You can, you can invest that now. <laughs> Infineon, I love a technology company. Without your support and help, I guess it, we could make that one. Andreas, I want to come back to you. Professor Samu was talking about um, Infineon. Um, from your perspective, it, what do you think the big technological breakthroughs that are going to be needed are? What, what's really going to drive progress in the next decade? I think uh, it's a couple of elements. Uh, so without order of priority, uh, definitely the proliferation of uh, artificial intelligence uh, is a base technology that enables a lot of things. No? It enables, uh, so to say, uh, intelligence or AI at the edge, all of a sudden commercially meaningful. And that means that uh, things that are surrounding us, uh, so be it electronics, be it uh, even our cars, be it, be it, uh, what you have uh, becomes simply much, much uh, smarter going forward. Uh, we always used to have uh, smart devices, but uh, when I think back about uh, my, uh, so to say, smart speaker five years ago, it was not necessarily so smart. No? So when I was asking the thing, um, uh, now I need to reveal, Alexa, what's the temperature outside? Uh, half of the time I got uh, an answer which had little to do with uh, the question. And here's the point. Uh, AI is a core technology to make uh, things understand better the context they are in and therefore do better interpretation of uh, the environment, better interpretation of uh, when we speak to things, better interpretation of, uh, so to say, the context where uh, things are uh, in a certain room and create digital twins. Yeah. So mm -hmm. just imagine a robot uh, as one example understanding uh, the current situation and the room scenario the, the, the thing is in. And based on that, and that requires artificial intelligence in the cloud and in the edge, is a key thing uh, in, in order to tell the robot what to do next and do a better job when working as a cobot uh, in a manufacturing line. But other than artificial intelligence, there's a lot of things uh, sure. in the pipeline, if you will. Sure. Many more topics to talk about, but I leave it uh, rather back to, uh, to the panelists and also. But Tilika, let me come to you then, if you don't mind. Um, so it, you can scale software. We all know that software is easily scalable. There's very there's little marginal cost. You're in the hard world of the physical hardware. world. Yeah, and hardware, physics, chemistry, tough stuff. Um, what's going to give us the leap forward, do you think, in terms of you know renewables? Maybe not just hydrogen, but other areas yep. as, as well. I think increasing applications at scale are really what uh, pushes forward. What we need is to have large-scale deployment of renewables. Uh, this is already a reality worldwide, mm. to be honest, uh, starting out, let's say, from the European Union um, and the US. I think Asia has really learned from that journey of uh, scaling up renewables and done it smarter, right? So if we think about how policy uh, legislation allowed for renewables to be scaled, First came incentives, first came subsidies, then came the large projects, then came the volume, mm. then things became subsidy free. On the other hand, our learnings in Asia have been that you can actually learn from that growth curve, that uh, learning curve, and, and jump ahead a little bit to adopt very quickly what's working. Yeah. Uh, so in many of the Asian markets, what we have seen in the terms of scaling out renewables has been immediate uh, going to auctions. Mm. Uh, and so finding that fastest path to lowest cost uh, is what is going to allow us to scale anything at sure. the end of the day. Sure. Um, and while software may have you know, very obvious implications for being rolled out quickly, um, the entire built world is based on the physical sciences and hardware product. Uh, we have good knowledge and experience as a human race in making hardware products work for us and making them cheaper over time. As we have done this for renewables, as we have done this for solar modules and wind panels, uh, wind uh, farms, we are about to see this unleashed for batteries. Yeah. I don't just talk about hydrogen. But yes, also for electrolyzers, um, we will find those unit economies of scale mm. by building hardware products uh, at larger volume yeah. for larger applications. And that's what's going to help us drive down uh, the unit cost for even larger wide-scale adoption. And you, you mentioned the EU earlier on. Wh who's doing this well? And uh, you, you mentioned that uh, Asia's scaling up at the moment. It's learning from um, mm. some of the ways in which it's these technologies have been implemented in Europe and the US. Yep. I is everyone now kind of learning from each other? Is there a kind of like a global sharing of, of ideas and um, technologies? 
I think it's a very opportune time for you to mention this question. Uh, COP27 has just happened. Right. It's been the implementation COP. It's interesting that in the last few years, we've really transitioned from not talking anymore about shall we commit to net zero? Who will commit to net zero? It has now become a dialogue about hard facts. How are we going to get there? What are the implementation strategies that we can have? Hmm. Without going into controversies, how can we have you know, development funds for those unfairly impacted by climate change? Uh, and how can we make it more equitable? Yeah. So I think a lot of this is coming from the fact that we have uh, urgency around this problem now. Uh, we do need to think about how we're going to uh, do this. Yeah. So there is no time for everybody to keep coming up the learning curve. I mean, we really learn very well from each other, just like artificial intelligence by talking you know, to each other, get o only more intelligent over time. Uh, it's the same thing. Uh, we, I think in Asia, we have seen a phenomenal growth in installed capacity of renewables. Uh, but also a phenomenal adoption of legislation and policy to make sure that you know, we're also committing to net zero. Um, we don't need to look much further than Singapore. We've recently announced enhanced targets for meeting our net zero emissions goals uh, much earlier than we had Im initially uh, envisaged. Uh, and amazingly, we've announced, I can't help but say this, uh, our national hydrogen strategy. Um, so I think everyone is coalescing around the idea of what is the fastest path to get yep. us there. Um, and different countries will do this in different ways because we are differently uh, endowed with renewable resources access to technology uh, and implementation mechanisms. So not one size fits all, but everybody, I think, is following the same pathway. Well, fortunately, we have someone on the panel who, who understands policy. Um, and I think that the point that Tulika was making is an interesting one because this is, well, actually, you use the phrase carrot and stick, right? So this is public and private sector working hand in glove. Um, I'd love to get your sense on how you think that this it can be most effective? How can the private sector and government really drive innovation together? Um, I think there needs to be an open platform for discussion. So I'll probably take a, an example of the work that we had earlier been doing this year on cooling, right? Singapore is in the tropics. Um, it can only get warmer, but cooling is a highly energy intensive need. How do we then think about cooling here in Singapore? Is it going to only be a stress point for our energy systems? Or can it then be turned into something that not only is a challenge, but also an opportunity? Right? So what would this take? It takes us understanding our energy systems a little bit better. So innovation cannot kind of happen in thinking just in the status quo. Right? If Singapore's energy system is always thought about as we're going to be gas-oriented, Gas is very flexible. You will never design financial mechanisms or policy mechanisms that will incentivize the use of storage, for example, batteries that you mentioned, which is very important for that change to happen. Only when we've innovated in the ways we think about our energy system, all of a sudden, because we know we want to get to net zero, we have to change this paradigm. It's no longer going to be gas-oriented. You will need to find flexibility from somewhere, and suddenly, not only batteries is a possible way of thinking about providing flexibility, being able to store cooling so that you use it sometimes later or earlier also becomes part of that flexibility. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, there is an incentive for businesses to then communicate with the government and say, hey, how do I get priced for this? How do I get paid for this flexibility? Yeah. Right. So I think there is this constant dialogue, but sometimes it does require that big big picture paradigm infrastructure to change. And there's a lot of different players that come into play. It's not just businesses. They are not-for-profit organizations. There's civil society. All of this place pressure on governments to think about things differently so that then businesses also have the opportunity to make that change happen together. Professor Sanwu, Andreas asked a question about autonomous vehicles, and we, you know, something that I think everyone in the room is pretty excited about. Um, we're in... Singapore, one of the world's great smart cities, it's you know, got incredibly kind of progressive uh, ideas on how we can be con connected uh, in built environments. There's so much talk about the Internet of Things. Sure. How do you think connectivity can make vehicles more efficient in, in cities? I guess without IoT, uh, very hard to achieve 
decarbonization, very important. So as you understand, if we connect every vehicle, we can share all information each vehicle gathers and, uh, data in real time. For instance, okay, somebody driving his vehicle and he actually uh, saw the accident and all those data already into the, uh, somebody else's vehicle. We can share any time. So that changed a whole lot. So without connectivity, we cannot make a good quality autonomous driving vehicle as well. So as I understand, in the future, I'm, I'm sure everybody, probably a lot of people are engineers from now here. And uh, these are the core technology for future. Number one, Andrea's already mentioned, artificial intelligence is very important. Big data, real-time big data, we can collect and you can share. And also software. Software changed the whole thing, whole different. I'm not sure uh, what type of smartphone you're using, Greg? Smartphone? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I've got an iPhone. iPhone? Yeah. Model what? Say again. What is the model number? Model number. I can't hear you. 13? Yeah, or 12? Yeah, okay. yeah. I have a 13 too. Yeah. But if I give my smartphone to you, yeah. you may not use my phone comfortably. Okay. Because we totally configuration differently. Yeah. Same thing in automobile too. Like uh, how many people driving Tesla at this time? <laughs> Not many. Are <laughs> 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 oh, you? Okay. At least one. <laughs> okay. I'm driving Tesla, but as you understand, recently I updated the software through the over the year, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, when I start my uh, vehicle cranking, and then this guy automatically uh, draw the navigation uh, at the map to go where he knows my driving pattern and my destination already. So they are using big data and they are using AI. And software changed the whole world. So sometimes someone wants to drive my Tesla, but this Tesla is a totally different way to behave with others of Tesla because they configure differently. Performance wise different. So I believe software defined the vehicle will be also very important part of future mobility. Mm. However, semiconductor is the backbone. Mm -hmm. So we must be proud of what you are working for. Yeah. Infineon, <laughs> number so, one. Uh, I, I, assure you. I know you make a lot I, of money I, I from all industry, <laughs> other sectors. I assure you I am, but uh, talking, talking about uh, uh, Tesla, that's a good example also for level, through, f level three. Uh, automated uh, driving and what I experience always uh, when uh, driving uh, level three on the motorway when I get my arms off the steering wheel uh, the thing uh, functions for a couple of, of seconds maybe even half a minute or so but then come certain situations and these typically occur uh, on the motorway from uh, Munich to Austria where we have lousy grid connection. I see. When all of a sudden the, 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 the car starts rippling and I need to go back to the steering wheel. I'm wondering, is fully automated driving only possible when the car is always connected to the internet? Exactly. And does this require, and that's my question, does this require satellite-based internet mm. to be always on? Exactly. So there we are developing a cellular network-based autonomous driving technology at this time. So very important. Greg mentioned IoT will be the uh, backbone for future mobility yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, just a reminder to everyone, we are going to be opening up to questions in about, uh, I think probably about sort of like 20 minutes, something like that. So please do uh, send through your questions online uh, and the audience, please, we're excited to hear what you think. Um, so, Andreas, I'm going to start with you, actually. We, we've touched a little bit on policy, but um, obviously government has a role. Um, but can you give us a sense in which you think that private companies uh, can combat climate change from your perspective? Yeah, uh, so there is uh, within, uh, so to say, ESG uh, regulation uh, already a kind of a framework which many of us are aware here without going into detail that gives a certain uh, direction. Yeah. Uh, but uh, talking about uh, Infineon as, as, as my company, uh, the way how we approach the whole thing is uh, we started with uh, a self-obligation. Uh, which uh, is uh, beyond, so to say, ES ESG targets uh, as such. Now, why do we do so? Because we, we want to be a driver, uh, but then also a role, a role model ourselves in the way how we manufacture, 
regarding uh, leaving a, an as little as possible CO2 footprint. And what we decided for ourselves is uh, to become uh, a CO2 uh, neutral by the year of 2030. Mm. So what I'm trying to say and what I want to inspire you also here and uh, the people uh, watching uh, the stream today, uh, thinking about a self-obligation, in particular for mm. corporates, is, uh, I believe, a very important thing. Uh, as it starts with, uh, so to say, a conviction and a strong will. We want and you want, and I want to encourage you uh, to help and contribute to decarbonize uh, planet Earth. And uh, as corporations, we have uh, a big responsibility, a social responsibility in doing so. And just one example, so Infineo set itself a target for 2030, so we want to be carbon neutral until uh, that year. Uh, we uh, have a plan in place uh, to reduce uh, CO2 e emission by, uh, 20, by 70 percent until 2025. Mm. I do not yet have all the measures in place for reaching the delta towards 2030. But uh, I do have a clear commitment and also a plan on how to proceed in order to fix the delta and get us uh, carbon neutral until then. Oh, we'll follow that story with, uh, with great interest. I mean, it's, 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 it's great that I think the companies are taking on this kind of leadership and also being open about the fact that you, we don't have all the answers yet. This is, this is kind of like a, it's still it's an open book. No, abs uh, absolutely. I mean, the one thing is uh, Infineon is a company in uh, semiconductors doing uh, a lot of uh, different chips uh, that uh, help to decarbonize the earth. Uh, so in essence, the chips uh, that we are selling, uh, like last year, according to the ESG report, which is done by public authority, okay, you're getting uh, cross-checked and certifi certified. Uh, the net uh, impact of uh, our semiconductors was factor 33 CO2 savings relative to the CO2 that we used for our manufacturing. Yeah. And here's uh, where it starts. Uh, so uh, I came to the conclusion quite a while ago that uh, decarbonizing the world is, is a business case, but it involves, it involves both the sides working on technologies that uh, themselves help to make more out of less. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, also look on ourselves and uh, use as little uh, resources as possible for getting the job done. In that case, uh, the manufacturing and bringing to the market of uh, semiconductor technologies. So you, I want to ask you um, about your experience of working with private companies mm. as well. Obviously, you know, all companies now have to have a plan. Uh, how do you start working with them? What advice do you give at the very beginning of the journey and um, take them through that transformation process? Yeah, um, there's a, as, as you said, it's a journey. Yeah. And I think that um, a lot of companies here in Asia are facing very, very different pressure points, right? Some of them um, who are located here in Singapore with the new SGX rulings, if you belong to certain types of industries and sectors, you are going to have to do certain levels of climate disclosures that you might not have done in the future. So there's this in intention of using transparency to help governments, uh, to help corporates change. Um, so for us at the Carbon Trust, we will therefore think about what does it what does it mean for a company if you're in these sectors, right? In these uh, sectors that are going to face regulatory changes. If you haven't even started measuring your own footprint, mm. we will always start there, right? Because you can never reduce what you don't know. But when we help, gov uh, when we help corporates think about these things, we want to encourage them to think beyond their operations. Because for almost every single sector, the largest part of your footprint is actually from what we call scope trees, so in your value chain. And we actually do see quite a number of companies that are here in Asia look at um, their scope tree. So for example, retail companies looking at where their materials uh, of the products that they created come from. Or um, we have also worked with uh, companies that have um, retail, retail fronts. So there might be a car manufacturing company with retail fronts. How do they help their retail fronts reduce the operations um, footprint? Yeah. Even though they are also a car manufacturing company. Right? So I think there are these types of uh, thought processes that we want to help companies think about. Where can you find the most impact and reduction? If, it's, if your operational footprint is only 20%, how do you think about the right types of work that you can do to look at the rest of the 80%? Okay. Right? So there can be industry coalitions coming together. Uh, we see that in Singapore a lot uh, on the real estate side. So they have, there is now an embodied carbon emissions uh, group. But this is entirely voluntary. Mm. Coming together to say up and down the value chain of real estate, uh, where can we reduce 
the materials emissions. I see, I see. And, and Tilika, I'd love to come to you. We're talking about large organizations. You're obviously a startup, a scale up. How would you describe yourself? Yes, a scale up at this stage. Scale up. So you've got enormous experience of building businesses in the renewable space. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have for people who maybe are thinking, you know, this is the area that I want to get into? How, how should, what advice would you give them on these are the areas they should be thinking about. This is where the opportunities are. I think uh, people and organizations really need to come at it from the um, uh, approach of a portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we think about portfolio construction, we often and we always actually think about risk. Why is a portfolio constructed? It's to reduce risk. Carbon is a risk. In every single organization in the world today, regardless of the jurisdiction, regardless of the regulation, you need to think about carbon as being a massive liability on your books that is coming for you. And so businesses, organizations, scale-ups, startups, SMEs, governments, uh, we're all actually ultimately thinking about it in the same way. There is a massive liability that the earth faces. We are part of it. It's on our books. It's coming for us. What are those steps that we can take right now to start impacting the massive buckets of carbon for our own particular footprint? Uh, often when organizations, customers that we work with, um, they're of course thinking about how they can decarbonize to meet either legislation, their own self-set decarbonization goals, um, their own net zero goals. Uh, they're thinking about legislation. Uh, in the maritime sector, the International Maritime Organization has set a massive whopping 40% decarbonization goal to 2030. How do you, how do you achieve that? So. Yeah you look towards cleaner fuels. Yeah. We stop using the bottom of the barrel stuff that's currently out there guzzling, you know, that our, 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 fuel, our vehicles are, and our ships are guzzling. Uh, and we start to think, in my particular industry, about hydrogen. And then you've got to think about it from a life cycle perspective. So as I mentioned earlier, if you know, at the end of the day, the hydrogen that you're using was created, this is an example, but it's hydrogen related. Um, at the end of the day, the hydrogen that you're using to decarbonize, you know, your massive carbon liability, is made from fossil fuels and adds 10 times as much carbon dioxide emissions in your scope one, you're not really achieving decarbonization. And at the end of the day, as um, my esteemed panelist was point pointing out, it's really a life cycle assessment. We are not looking at this in a isolation kind of a case. So it's gotta be an end-to-end -end solution. We've gotta think about carbon as an end-to-end -end liability. Uh, and manage that risk on our books as businesses. And uh, as Andrea has rightly pointed out, that can be ultimately good for the bottom line. And that's how we decarbonize at scale. So I've got, I've got a question for the, for the entire panel, really, which is, is th just the scale of what we're trying to do here. We're, we've got to figure out how we make things, grow things, warm ourselves, cool ourselves, uh, stay warm in the winter, uh, if you're living in you know, Austria or, or the UK. Um, <laughs> Things are going to have to fundamentally change. And I guess the question for the group is, can we have this kind of wholesale, wholesale transformation um, for you know, high income populations while also continuing to lift billions of people out of poverty? How do we address, how do we address this kind of uh, lifestyle challenge? Does anyone want to take that huge hot potato and, uh, uh, and, think, and uh, let the audience know your thoughts? Well, I'm not a politician, so singing maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> it's a uh, that's a big issue, actually. It's a, it's a huge maybe issue, Maybe it right? takes for a while to cover that part. Maybe you may address. No, but uh, just as an interim comment, I believe uh, uh, the Western world, uh, and uh, I think almost everybody uh, of us here today in the room at least, uh, living in the Western world and being part of it uh, definitely has uh, an obligation to contribute uh, an extra piece uh, towards uh, decarbonizing planet Earth. No? Because when you look into uh, who is uh, the source of 90% uh, of uh, CO2 emissions, uh, it is, it is what, what is being called the Western world, yeah? at the cost of the, so to say, developing countries, if you will. And having said that, it's, it's truly up to us to lift this obligation. We have been driving growth and, uh, so to say, driving our own consumer habits and the way how we live, how we eat, based on very cheap energy cost, yeah. cheap energy coming from fossil energy uh, sources that we pumped out of the earth and uh, 
convert it into energy that allows all this welfare and uh, way of living uh, and leads to the warming up of uh, the planet. And having said that, us having done this at the cost of uh, environment where today floodings and climate catastrophes are uh, very often hitting developing countries as an effect, we have the obligation to uh, continue massive action with regards to energy transition. So it has been mentioned we need to drive going out of fossil uh, energy uh, uh, so, to, so to say, generation uh, towards, towards renewables, including uh, the required storage uh, technologies such as hydrogen, the required uh, smart grid technologies to transport uh, electricity from A to B to C uh, in a, uh, so to say, sustainable manner, but uh, then also having uh, in place uh, the whole uh, charging infrastructure. So charging be it uh, in my private household, when uh, I have my own uh, solar panels at the roof, I, I need some charging potential then yeah. uh, also and, and some, some battery or maybe in the long run even hydrogen-based uh, storage yeah. in between. It, it is those elements that we have to bring, to bring forward. Yeah? And uh, having said that, there's a lot uh, everybody individually and <laughs> corporate can do. Well, I, I, I fully agree with what um, Andrea said, especially here sitting in Singapore, uh, in across the whole Southeast Asia region, right? We do have a different type of responsibility, not just because, um, not just because we have developed and uh, consumed that level of energy, but also because we are a financial hub and there are many, many different levers that can be used as a financial hub to be able to enable that change to happen in Southeast Asia. But I do want to point out a couple of things, that the decarbonization process, um, the, the just transition conversation around decarbonization has only, is, is a slightly recent uh, thing that has come into the lexicon, even though most of the emerging markets have been talking about it for a very long time, right? So the loss and damage fund that has come out from COP27 is one part of the just transition. But another part of the just transition is being able to bring the, finance, the finances that is needed to enable the transition in energy to be just, right? So there were also multiple financial mechanisms um, or financial platform uh, announcements at COP27 that tries to enable the energy transition to accelerate here in all emerging markets, including here in Southeast Asia. And I think that that's something that we need to continue to work at. I think at the Carbon Trust, we've worked in a couple of other countries thinking about what just transition actually means, mm. right? And who are the workers that you need to think about? Um, what kind of pensions you need to think about if you're transitioning away from coal? The whole coal industry in India, for example, is huge. If you want to transition them, it's not just about your power systems transitioning, it's about your workforce, it's about reskilling them. And all of this costs money, and all of this is going to be a burden if it's not going to be uh, financed. But on the flip side, if you move away from coal, there are healthcare benefits that nobody really talks about. Yeah. So the decarbonization uh, process itself is just so in, in some way, shapes or form. But we also have to think about where the money is coming from. I just want to make sure that people don't think that decarbonization is going to only be a burden to um, emerging markets. There are many healthcare benefits that we do not talk about when we move away from fossil fuels. And there's also, I guess, many opportunities for, for business. Absolutely. I mean, what I was going to say is uh, we don't live in an isolated world. The world is connected. The natural ecosystem that we all live in is completely connected. It's not like floods and fires and rising temperatures and sea levels are impacting, you know, isolated nations. Yes, there may be countries that are facing the brunt of it to start with, but ultimately everybody is getting impacted. So if we take a sort of larger, you know, bird's eye view of the situation, then uh, it behoves us to work together, you know, at the largest levels of team playership, if you like, on a global level, to think about how we're making sure that we're not, you know, greening ourselves or decarbonizing in isolation. Sustainability is not limited to a single nation or, or a group of nations. Sustainability is for everybody because the world is in a natural balance. Um, if we go out of whack on the one uh, dimension, it is bound to impact all the other different dimensions. So bringing that back to, you know, the Western world or um, the developing nations, uh, we do need to act in cohesion. We do need to think about uh, how we can solve these problems from a win-win situation for all, and ultimately the benefits that that unlocks, forget about CO2 emissions, but about cleaner air quality, lower uh, respiratory diseases, you know, across both the developing and the developed world, 
are ultimately beneficial to us all. So sustainability is not occurring in isolation. We do have to work together as a global group. One question for you, Professor Samwu. Just, I want to touch, go back to the automotive industry just very briefly before we go to the audience questions. Really, I'd, I'd love to get your sense of how you think it's going to change from both the supply side point of view, so hydrogen, biofuels, you know, internal, custom, sorry, internal combustion engine uh, ending, and also the demand side, so the cost, customer mindset. Like, how do you think that's going to change over the next decade? Actually, that's a big headache, especially in Korea at this time. Yeah. Because as you understand, the Korean auto industry is very important, essential uh, industry for Korean whole Korean economy. So all of a sudden, as you understand, uh, conventional uh, internal combustion engine vehicle requires uh, more than 30,000 parts. But when we transit from the internal combustion engine to electric vehicle, the number of parts will be reduced by half. So which means supplier, part supplier should be gone. So Korean government trying to help them to transit from internal combustion engine industry to EV industry. But change, change is not yeah. easy to transit from conventional to EV. So we must, uh, that requires extensive collaboration work with the supply side and also demand side and taxation problem comes. So, and also number of employees, yeah. especially uh, now I guess Germany also suffering from the same type of situation because you guys are losing a lot of uh, number of employees, uh, I mean the employment, from the uh, fossil fuel uh, based uh, auto industry to EV industry. So that's the headache for Korean government at this time. So I mean collaboration will be the uh, 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 inevitable okay. in the future. So I cannot give you some just a you know simple sure. yeah, of course. answer. It's a complex. It's a complex. Very complex. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're going to move on to audience questions now, and I think maybe this one uh, question two might be for you, Professor Samwu, in terms of medium voltage AC to LDVC technology. So I'll, I'll read the question: um, Can we have medium voltage AC? to LDVC technology to go for high power charging? Yes. If yes, when well, will it happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody understand LDVC is a very adequate and efficient way to charge quickly. However, nothing comes, I mean, there is no free lunch. Uh, you have to change it from AC to DC, mm -hmm. and that costs a lot. However, Infineon, Power device semiconductor can prove, uh, improve <laughs> that uh, uh, quality. So, I'm in the future, market wise, <laughs> Infineon, mm. you guys have a very rosy future. So, which is good for you guys. Anyhow, everything involves technology. So, we understand these technologies much better than this one, but it costs. So, anyhow, uh, I always said, hey, Decarbonization is a very important issue at this time, very challenging issue. However, uh, it's cost money. So, but uh, I would say better late than never. No matter what, we have to start to change current system or current industry to eco-friendly. Otherwise, climate crisis, we cannot uh, overcome this big issue in the near decade. Okay, I'd love to take a couple of questions from the audience. If anyone's got any thoughts, they'd like to direct anything to any of our panelists. If not, we do have more questions coming online, but come on, I know you guys have got questions. Gentlemen there. Yeah, we do. yeah sorry, I think there's a roving mic coming to you. It's just coming. Hi, um, good evening. A uh, question for uh, Ms. Dulika. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing and the insight. So um, my question relates to hydrogen which is a hot topic these days. Uh, my question is purely uh, out of interest and curiosity. So I think it's been said that uh, the extraction of hydrogen as a blue or green energy source itself uses a lot of uh, power, electricity. Yes. Yes. Uh, the process itself releases a lot of carbon dioxide into the air along with uh, methane. Uh, and some of it is actually leaked from the ground as it's been extracted. 
uh, and methane itself uh, is uh, actually a uh, you know a bad gas, right? And we all know that. So um, I I'm not sure whether uh, will the good of hydrogen as a green or blue uh, energy source negate the bad that comes with it. Number one, um, and number two. As the world gets to know hydrogen and the extraction process better, um, will the world embrace it as a sustainable form of blue or green energy source? And the last question is, uh, what in your uh, opinion will be the leading world producer of hydrogen gas as an energy source? Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think we cover everything with your question, blue uh, versus green hydrogen and um, resource efficiency. Actually, to your first, uh, to I think one of the most fundamental things that might be relevant to share is um, hydrogen was originally started, uh, uh, you know, to be created or extracted. The first, the world's first extraction technology for hydrogen is electrolysis. So we, as a human race, have really looked at water electrolysis, the splitting of H2O molecules into hydrogen and oxygen, hundred years ago. It was the predominant means of creating hydrogen. So this is a commercially available technology that's been around for 100 years, up until the 1960s, when cheap fossil fuels uh, became available. And then perhaps it became uh, more efficient to, attra uh, to extract, let's say, hydrogen from hydrocarbons as opposed to water. This is the background uh, and the history of hydrogen extraction process, very well established and already being used worldwide. The next thing that comes into the story is that from the 1960s till today, we have started using uh, 90 million tons, let's say, of hydrogen in lots of different applications already. So the use, production, transport, storage, infrastructure related to hydrogen is not unknown to us. Uh, globally, this is already in use. The difference now becomes that in a decarbonized society, there is no room for carbon dioxide emissions. So we go back to your point about uh, does gray hydrogen really solve the problem? Not really. It's creating 10 times as many, 10, ti 10 tons of CO2 emissions for every ton of hydrogen created from natural gas or coal. Uh, well, we have a solution for that. If you think about blue hydrogen, mm -hmm. then uh, blue hydrogen is the carbon capture and sequestration of um, CO2 emissions from the natural gas or the steam methane reforming process. But please remember that no industrial process is 100% efficient ever. This is against the law of thermodynamics. In other words, as you rightly point out, the extraction of natural gas or methane uh, into the points where you can carbon capture and sequester it already is responsible for creating a lot of methane emission leakage into the atmosphere. So end to end, this is not a long-term solution that we can solve for. Blue hydrogen, which we talk about when we say blue hydrogen, we add CCS to it. CCS is not a 100% efficient process. So at the end of the day, I think a lot of the policy and a lot of the adoption of hydrogen uh, for future, um, the mechanisms have already looked through this. So you will find that in the United States, as well as in the European Union, where there is a $3 per kg of production tax credit already awarded for 10 years for green hydrogen production, only green hydrogen really qualifies for the full benefit of this production tax credit. Why? Because as a policy mechanism, what is trying to be incentivized is green or carbon-free hydrogen, which really comes from water electrolysis. On the second point, when we think about a long-term use, we don't have green hydrogen currently available at the scale that it needs to be. So we cannot overnight have a value chain and infrastructure and an ecosystem develop. As the professor rightly pointed out, we must take a single step. We put the first solar panel in someone's farm. That's why we have a massive solar industry today. Same way, we are making electrolyzers at the moment. They are about to become mass produced, and you know what that means for unit costs. We have the renewable electricity. We do have a way of unlocking zero carbon green hydrogen at scale, but we have to take the first step. These first steps are coming in those markets that have already legislated for the adoption of green hydrogen, in the form of the $3 per kg tax credit in the United States, the $3 billion European Hydrogen Bank that has now been passed to guarantee the purchase or the offtake of green hydrogen. This is how we will see projects get financed. This is how we will see lots and lots of electrolyzers and green hydrogen projects get off the ground. Uh, and this is one of the key reasons why green hydrogen in particular is now entering hockey stick territory. 
Has that, has that answered all your questions? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Happy customer. Um, any, other, any other questions from the audience here uh, in Singapore? Come on, I know. Ah, over there, please. Fine. Back row. We've got a microphone coming over. Hi, a question addressed to Andres. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for today. We, we make a first step of uh, moving away from beef. So everything is vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. So we all make a first step today. Um, uh, just now, when Professor um, uh, Sun Wen mentioned, yeah, with regard to the automotive, yeah, you, there was a, uh, I, I sense that there's a different opinion with regard to how many vehicles that we're going to be put on the road, yeah, when we change from industrial combustion engine to electric vehicle. Um, so while the um, uh, automotive manufacturers still continue to put more vehicles on the road, yeah, making the change, while and also um, uh, automotive manufacturing being a very big share of also Invenient customer. How do you see that um, growth? Is it holding you back in terms of reaching your 2030 target or helping you to accelerate your 2030 target? Mm. Uh, well, uh, first and foremost, uh, I believe that uh, looking back uh, and looking into average growth in terms of number of cars sold in the past, uh, going forward, uh, I personally uh, believe there will be a deceleration of uh, annual uh, car production relative to the past, point yeah. number one. Uh, why? Uh, and here I come to point number two. Uh, that has to do, uh, of course, with uh, economic consideration that go in the direction uh, as discussed before. Uh, so car sharing is uh, something that uh, will uh, come uh, exponentially fast. We see that left and right. And uh, for me, maybe, uh, and, and, and me being used to own a car, it still sounds um, and feels unnatural to, to take a car off the road uh, and use a car sharing company. But guess what my kids are doing? They are in that. Full steam ahead. My, my kids are no longer thinking about owning a car in, in five or, or ten years from now when they will be economically on, on their own feet and, and, and can make such, uh, such a decision. So having said that, uh, with, uh, so to say, uh, uh, habits uh, of human beings changing from owning to using things, uh, coupled with and also the automated car going for, forward, yeah? so, 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 so the robot car, if you will, I believe uh, that, is, that is a massive driver towards, uh, uh, so to say, on the one hand side, uh, a lesser steep growth of, of car production on the one hand side, but on the other side, and now I come to Infineon, it is a huge driver of semiconductor content. Because when you look uh, into an automated electronic car uh, of uh, today and to get it towards level uh, four or even level five automated driving, uh, at the very end, 93% uh, uh, of all the innovation happening in this car is supported or driven by semiconductors. And that's why the automated self-driving uh, electrified car, including the charging infrastructure, including storage uh, systems such as also hydrogen and yeah. a couple of others, is uh, going forward the big, big business case. In other words, decarbonization is our business case. Yeah. Professor Samuel, do you want to jump in on what Andreas well, has said. <coughs> I agree with Arlen Andreas. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, semiconductor business-wise, uh, sure. Uh, let me tell you one thing. When I moved from California to Detroit to join General Motors, that was the mid-80s. Uh, that time, the, the uh, new car market was you know, increased. They actually uh, uh, through the uh, roof. But uh, all of a sudden, Automated vehicle is available, an electric vehicle, based on that. I mean, number of uh, required vehicle will be reduced substantially. However, in order to operate all those vehicles, less number of vehicles, requires technologies, new technology. And uh, that requires, he already mentioned, uh, charging station, a V2Z, someone already mentioned that, requires a new technology for each home to adopt all those, you know, uh, leftover energy. So, uh, in terms of semiconductor business-wise, it's not really bad, but auto industry-wise, they do not want to hear sharing service. They want to sell, for example, five people, household, they should have a five vehicle. Each, each one has, each one drives the vehicle. But all of a sudden, two families, five households, five siblings, they want to just to buy only one vehicle to share of 10. That's not good numbers. So OEM doesn't want to hear that. 
However, that's the reason OEM, they want to make new business model based on EV. So battery from the starting to the end, they try to recover all those batteries to make like ESS, like energy storage system to provide, you know, leftover energy to like a uh, uh, you know, household. So they are changing platform at this time very, I mean, very rapidly. So, but anyhow, semiconductor business, you guys are okay for the future. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'd like to come back to semiconductor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like maybe I, can, I wanted to add a financial overview to this as an ex-banker, right? Um, there are reasons why an OEM manufacturer wants to sell more and more vehicles. It's because that's what their stock price is being measured against, right? So the moment you start changing the way the financial system sees what a company should be doing, there will be flow-throughs. Right. So in the past, in the previous work that I did, that was the reason why I worked with institutional investors to have stewardship conversations with companies. Companies need to hear from investors that they want to see the company change their business model. They want to see the company fix the way they think about their business model so that the investor will have a different view of what they should be measuring the company against. Yeah. Right. So as car companies move away from being a car company to being a mobility company, the metrics will need to change. If you don't change those metrics, you will never see the shift happen. So I think, um, I, you know, from a financial perspective, the way you value a company becomes part of the picture. Uh, you have to change the way you think about valuation of company. Carbon pricing comes into play. There is a big question, if you're an OEM com company and you want them to not sell more vehicles, do you then say that the mileage that is driven by your vehicles as part of your carbon footprint that you should be responsible for, right? That's scope three. The more you enable that, the more, the faster you will help companies see that they need to change their business strategy. So very quickly, we've got just I'll over like six just minutes. Like oh, sorry, a, Professor Sanwu. Yeah, okay, I'd like to add one more uh, uh, good news for you guys. Uh, just, uh, just a few weeks ago, one of the high official Korean government official called me and asked me to stop by. So I went to the Korean government. Uh, they asked me why Samsung Electronics, Samsung Semiconductor Company, can cooperate with the Hyundai World Company. So they believe uh, we are suffering from the uh, shortage of semiconductor at this time. Samsung Electronics is number one semiconductor produce. They believe they can switch from Samsung semiconductor product to automotive product in a second. It's not totally different technology. As I mentioned, Delco Electronics owned by General Motors, the semiconductor, they're still using mainly eight inch wafers. No memory company uses eight inch wafer. You cannot make that. So you cannot change from 12 inch wafer semiconductor company to eight inch or six inch. It's not that way. It's not that simple. So I believe Infineon has much a strong foothold than semiconductor of Samsung. <laughs> <laughs> Is that good news? <laughs> so, um, <Bravo>. thank you. <laughs> Don't tell Samsung. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, we have just over, well, just under five minutes now to wrap this up. We've got three more questions coming in online. Um, would you mind taking this question? It's, it's to do, it's about electrification. You know, how do we ensure so much electricity today is produced using, you know, coal? Um, how do we ensure that the source of electricity is clean? A very pertinent question because greenwashing was on the agenda at, at, at COP27. Yeah, yeah um, it's definitely a pertinent question. A lot of Southeast Asian companies that we work with find it very difficult to think about net zero simply because the energy system is not yet clean. But we ha there are, there are uh, good news on the horizon. We do see the flow through of some of the net zero and carbon neutral uh, commitments by Southeast Asian countries actually flow through into their power sector development policies, yeah. right? And once you start seeing that, including subsidies, including things like that, you will see a type of shift that can happen. But I think that, um, as I mentioned just now, this transition away from fossil to renewable, is this a dial up? together with a dial down. You need to see the dial down happen. And in different markets, that challenge is slightly different. So for example, in Indonesia, um, the grid is actually oversupplied. If you do not dial down the coal, you can't actually dial up the renewables. Right? So then the innovation here becomes something 
other than technology innovation. It becomes innovation of financial mechanisms. How do you use, and I'm an ex-banker, I used to work in structured financing, this thing really gets me excited, right? How do you think about financial mechanisms that can align the different incentives of different players in order to see this happen? The, we have to be able to think about um, issues like this for Southeast Asia if we want to see the transition happen. Another question. We've got three minutes now. Um, Professor Samuel, I don't know if this is one for you. How does V2G affect the utility supply, and will this be adopted widely in the future? Definitely a uh, vehicle to grid. It's very important technology also. But uh, that's the reason Hyundai Motor Company, they actually have a several uh, startup company working on uh, battery uses from the uh, scratch to the end. So as you understand, conventional vehicle-wise, most expensive part is engine and transmission. Mm -hmm. But electric vehicle, most expensive part is battery. So they don't want to lose this battery business. So they're trying to utilize this battery to something else. So V2G is very important for their future business model. So it will be used, but I'm not sure when, but still the number of batteries is not a small number, but maybe 2030, uh, they will, uh, the number will be quite uh, high then. They may start a real business in that. And a final question, I think, for you, Andreas. Infineon, <coughs> Infineon's manufacturing, um, are you moving towards decarbonization? What's the plan? <laughs> um, uh, what's the action, I <laughs> tend to say? So there is a couple of actions, of course, but let me name two of which. Uh, uh, the most important uh, by far is uh, the use of uh, energy and uh, semiconductor is, is uh, manufacturing of semiconductors is energy intensive. Yeah. So what we're doing is uh, that we source to the broadest extent possible uh, green energy. And so we buy green energy, which is uh, rather easy to do uh, in Europe. Uh, is a challenge in the US, but even there we are 100% on green energy already. Asia Pacific still a challenge. So getting a uh, hold of green energy in Asia Pac, I encourage you, there are many people and uh, stakeholders in the room uh, who, who can drive that forward and help to make green energy uh, availability uh, also cross country wide uh, in uh, the specific, uh, so to say, grids from the north of uh, Asia, or if you will, uh, towards the south, and uh, having electricity that is produced green, transported into a hub like Singapore. That is the name of game going forward. Second topic of uh, Infineon uh, and Infineon's way uh, going, uh, so to say, uh, CO2 neutral, definitely is smart manufacturing techniques. And that's always a challenge, you know, at any point in time when you look into your manufacturing equipment, you say, oh, is it written off? Is it depreciated? Do you drive it to the very last moment until it passes away uh, to uh, enjoy, so to say, uh, scale effects? Or do you go for the more modern uh, equipment? And here Infineon is uh, committed uh, to uh, take it, uh, if you will, the hard way uh, and the ambitious way. So we go for the most modern manufacturing techniques and energy efficient manufacturing equipment which is another piece of uh, the solution, because uh, the lesser uh, resources you need for uh, producing one and the same, the better it is for the energy bill. Thank you, Andreas. Um, thank you, panel. Um, I think we covered a lot of ground. Thank you all for being so insightful, having such energy, and offering us so many insights, and I think lots of action that we can, we can all take. Um, thank you all for joining us um, this evening, uh, this Tech 4 event, um, and making the conversation so lively, so vigorous, uh, and so thoughtful. Some really great questions coming in from you uh, on the live stream. Thank you to the audience here, uh, and to uh, our, our hosts here with this amazing venue. Um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation uh, in the coming months and years. Um, thank you for joining us, and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>